When you hear the words honor and shame, what do you think of? Perhaps you think of some medieval knight trying to win the heart of a princess. Or maybe you think of uh, honor killings. Um, maybe when you think of shame, you think of uh, some psychologist in his office talking about you know, deep family problems. Or some people, I've heard, think it's just about pride. You know, they just need to get rid of their honor and shame perspective because it's just about pride and their own reputation. Well, each one of those impressions, it has a bit of truth to it, but it's a bit incomplete. Let's clarify the meaning of honor and shame. First, let's clarify what honor and shame is as opposed to guilt. Guilt is about the bad things we do. It's about what we do. Honor and shame is about who we are. So it's the difference between I did bad and I am bad. Now there's two ways in which you could uh, get honor or shame. It could be achieved or ascribed. Now, achieved is uh, stressed in the West a little bit more than, say, in a lot of Eastern cultures. So, like, if you uh, achieve uh, some kind of a promotion or get good grades or whatnot, or if you fail and have some kind of a big problem, then that would be achieved shame or honor. Now, what about ascribed honor? This is the kind of honor that you have because of some relationship you had. Now, just imagine that if I were in America and my last name were Obama or Clinton or Bush, well, because I have the name of the president, maybe in their family, I would automatically have some sort of some honor ascribed to me. Or perhaps shame, because maybe of gender, economic class, skin color, it could be any number of things. Now, there's one, one more misunderstanding that needs clarification. People frequently say, well, Guilt, that's objective. And boy, shame, that's just subjective, psychological. It's about culture anthropology. Well, the problem is, is that they're both objective and subjective. For example, subjectively, I could have guilt feelings, guilty feelings. And that could be legitimate or, or, or false. You know, I shouldn't have those feelings. Or they could be objective. I could, in other words, I could objectively have done something wrong. Shame is the same way. Of course, you know, I could have uh, feel shame, have a sense of shame, but also I could have uh, objective shame because objectively speaking, I am uh, unworthy of, say, praise or honor, or I am actually, or I should say, I am worthy of, of censure, of rebuke, of uh, people looking down on me because of maybe something I've done or a way I've acted or something of that nature. You know, when we talk about the glory of God, you know, or God's honor, we're not talking about just a psychological feeling God has. We're talking about something that is true and real. So what is an honor-shame perspective? Well, typically, an honor-shame perspective is marked by three distinct characteristics. I'll give you an easy way to remember it first. It, it's, it focuses on, honor-shame perspective focuses on what is standard, what is social, and what is sovereign? Now, let's start with the last one because that's a little bit easier. What is sovereign? We're talking about who has authority. We're talking about hierarchy. Uh, honor shame perspective tends to really respect uh, social rank. And this could come in different ways. For example, uh, a teacher, a boss, parents, uh, the king. Uh, it, you basically give honor to people and maybe even you know, yield to what the authority says. The opposite would be like a typical Western egalitarianism where it's like, okay, we're all equal. You know, no one's you know, above anyone else. The second aspect, what is social? In other words, relationships, social connections. There's greater priority and emphasis and thought given to who am I with respect to other people? Who do I know? Who knows me? This, is, this contrast uh, maybe Western individualism, where I am how I'm not like other people. Well, from an honor shame perspective, there may be more of an emphasis on how am I like other people. So you're going to have a lot more of a, of a concern for who are insiders, who are outsiders. Now, the last aspect, what is standard, can be a little tricky to understand. Basically, you can think about it like this. Whatever is standard, what is normal, what is typical, well, 
that becomes people's standard. That is the rule, what they should do. You might say, what is, is what should be. How, you know, a lot of Eastern uh, cultures, they look to the world, uh, you know, the natural world kind of as a clue for what's right and wrong. And so you have this idea of, uh, of what is concrete and practical. That's, that what, that's what we should emphasize. And, and so this affects authority and it affects relationships. So, you know, they may say, uh, well, um, bloodline is the most natural relationship. And so we're going to emphasize that over everything else. Because in honor shame uh, society, honor shame culture, there's a value for what is stable, what is normal. Uh, and people will look down on uniqueness and, and being different. Uniformity is valued, maybe probably above all other values, it seems at times. So you have those three. You have what is standard, what is social, and what is sovereign. And consequently, you have a few other things that often come with an honor shame perspective, like this very practical mindedness. Uh, don't tend to think in a lot of abstractions. They're not so much concerned with the next life, but they want to know also, well, how does this message you're sharing, what this thing you're saying to me, how does it affect now and the relationships that I have, you know, when I go home or go to work? They want to know why does this matter? But then there's also something that's common of, of this emphasis on purity or sacred space. Why? Purity language is just another way of talking about what we honor or we value. Well, if it's defiled or filthy, we'll say it's shameful, it's kind of out, it's away from us, we want distance. So you also see that in a lot of honor-shame perspectives. Now, you can probably see that honor-shame thinking, that's not unique to China or Japan or, you know, Eastern cultures. This is really a human thing. You think about in the West, say, for example, in America, What's maybe the most popular website people go to? Facebook. No, face is just a, uh, a Chinese way of talking about honor and shame. But you know, in Facebook and social media, people want to like me, be a fan, follow, you know, be a follower of me. Everybody wants you know, to, to everybody be part of their network. If you've ever been to junior high, well, you know very well what an honor shame culture is. Uh, in America, uh, you know, honor shame cultures are everywhere. You have the American South, you have uh, let's see, uh, the military and sports culture. I mean, who has not said at some point, we won the championship or oh, we, we got crushed. And you want to say, you want to say we? we? Were you on the field? Well, because you see what we want is that we tend to associate ourselves with some group, some kind of collective and either share in their honor or unfortunately share in their shame. So. This is really a human thing, not simply an East thing, Eastern thing versus a Western thing. And if we understand what an honor-shame perspective is, we can better love people and have more fruitful ministry.